So let's say you've um, looked into Dagger for a little while. You've uh, interpreted some of the techniques, played a little bit around with them. You can kind of have like a little toolbox of techniques, but you've yet to manage to get into sparring. Or you've tried your hand at sparring, but you weren't really happy with how it turned out. You thought it was kind of too, not exactly how how it sh matched, didn't match what was looking, in, what your impression was uh, that the goal was in the manuals then I think this video series is for you. Uh, I'm going to present how I bring people into sparring that is as close to the manuals as I think it's possible to get at this moment. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to do this in a video series and so this video is going to be a bit theory heavy and then the next few ones I'm going to do with demonstrate with a partner and we're going to get into real sparring and you're going to see how it progresses and it's quite quick. I can usually bring somebody into my approach to sparring within at least one session, probably less. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go into it. I'm going to start off with describing three potential pitfalls that we have to be wary of, that we want to avoid. Some of you might already be past this, you don't, they're not an issue. In that case, just scroll on by, I don't have a time marker, but just go ahead. Uh, the first one is uh, when people have, and all of these, by the way, are, are pitfalls that I have seen frequently argued uh, on, on various Facebook and, and forum groups. The first one is that dagger in HEMA just doesn't work. Um, I mean, um, they, they, they basically think that every other weapon in HEMA has some, you know, ha has a merit to it, but Dagger for some reason is just bullshit. And this often is because they have, you know, looked at the, ma the, the manuals, tried, tried their hand at interpreting the techniques and found them to be not what they expected. Now, usually, without being sounding like an asshole, this usually has to do with competence, not really with, or perhaps effort put into it, then really with the dagger manuals in themselves. Um, it is quite possible to make something completely useful out of the manuals and the techniques as described usually work. It's just your perception of what it should look like or the com you haven't practiced them enough or and found the way to use them. Um, so. Uh, and, and I'm assuming that you're kind of past this if you're looking at this video channel, but you know, you might be in that ballpark and wanting to get out, in which case this video series might help you. So the second one uh, is a distant cousin of this one. It's basically when something I see where very often people have, you know, have looked at the manuals, they've tried some of the techniques, and then when they go into sparring, the sparring end up looking nothing like what's described in the manuals. They, they manage to almost pull off none of the techniques, or very few of them. Their, their sparring format very often is based on uh, what I call hamster fighting, which is like very, very often they have their, hold their hands here, and the dagger out, and then they go, or even worse, they have, hold their ha dagger forward like a, some sort of rapier and ignore everything in the manuals. The only manuals that really consequently teach forward is Marozzo and he's in kind of a ballpark on his own. I, I think I wouldn't, they would probably maybe not. If you're doing Marozzo, dagger on dagger, I think this video series might not be as good as uh, for you as if you're doing the other earlier or earlier Italian or the German uh, daggers. Um, so anyway, uh, it's very often speed oriented. It's very much like a game of tag and, and there's not a lot of power behind them. It's everything is speed and very often you keep your guard like a boxer. The thing about this is that this is nothing like the, ma the, the German manuals uh, describe. It's nothing like what I can see in Fiora either. Um, and what's interesting is that in the manuals, the, the, the only things you see defenses against are heavy, determined, uh, and quite large attacks. And what we can draw as a conclusion from this is that these were the attacks that they were worried about. Now, I've been, I've done Filipino martial arts and Indonesian martial arts for a long time, and 
what you end up uh, seeing there is you see a lot of this fast moving and then you see techniques it's called knife trapping where you kind of go in and trap the hands this is what is what you'd expect to see if fast attacks were really a thing these are fast but you know these fast short attacks were really a thing and you don't see them there's there's basically nothing of that manner in the in the manuals so we can be pretty surely say that that wasn't something they were terribly worried about or something they were thinking about was it because they didn't know how i don't think so the the com the hypothesis that basically is has reached consensus at this moment is that the reason that people do the heavy attacks is that daggers had to penetrate textile armor uh things like gambeson or several layers of clothing uh, of textiles um arming doublets that kind of thing it has to penetrate this and that requires a certain amount of power and if you're not generating that power you're basically not going to penetrate so you can basically just ignore the attacks or they wouldn't be as powerful enough to really hurt you that they would hurt you less so that's why the third pitfall is uh, actually something that that uh, stems from good research and actually good, good thinking but they kind of took a wrong turn in my opinion and the thing is when you're researching manuals you should like look into social cultural historical context to try to find explanations of why things look the way they do but you can end up in the situation where you're looking to find explanations of why you shouldn't do what's described in the manual and that's a pitfall because then you're trying to explain away the manual. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying to disprove a manual, but if you're trying to interpret it and trying to do the martial art described in it, you're ultimately failing if you're trying to disprove it. Um, and from this, you see people saying things like, oh, but daggers, they're not meant for fighting. They're meant for murder, you know, for assault in the back alley. And the thing is, if you look at the manuals, Look at Meyer's manual, which is the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, you can separate his manual into his dagger part into two main parts. One is empty hand versus dagger. I, and the context is, I don't have a dagger. My opponent has a dagger. I have seen him. He has seen me. We acknowledge each other. We realize there's going to be a fight and there is a defense. The second one is second context is dagger on dagger, where the context is simply, I have a dagger, my opponent has a dagger, we've both drawn them, we acknowledge each other as enemies, and we realize this is going to be a fight. Those are the two contexts that are dealt with in the manual. Now, you may find that this is unrealistic, and I can agree with you. Uh, and the, one of the arguments that's brought to the table here is that, for example, if you look at period dagger violence, it turns out it was mostly... The, the, the accounts we have found very often deal with, with you know somebody attacking you from behind in the dark alleyway or something like this. And I don't despite that. I don't, I don't think that's wrong. I think that might be completely correct. <clears throat> but we have to keep in mind we're not recreating period violence. We're rec recreating the martial art people train to prepare themselves for violence. And here's the crux. Training n never looks like a real fight uh, and it's still really useful if you go into a boxing gym or a brazilian jiu-jitsu gym or a krav maga gym or any any fucking martial arts contemporary martial arts gym you choose and you go and look at a, a normal fight they look nothing like each other in even the sparring but i tell you what i've been a bouncer for over 20 years i've been in lots of fights i've witnessed even more and people who have martial arts background, they tend to do really well in fights. And people who have a martial arts background tend to not fight like the way they spar. They tend to not fight the way they train. However, you can, if you analyze it into small segments, you'll see individual parts of that surfacing. So the training that they received really helped, even if what they're doing doesn't look exactly like what uh, like um uh, like the training they've done and that's just the nature of martial arts if you're expecting it to look like re realistic violence you have wrong expectations 
martial arts doesn't look like exactly like uh, period violence. It looks like period martial arts. Uh, so, and and the reason why I bring up this is that if that the this will this will be uh, important when we start looking into the way I approach uh, dagger fighting or dagger sparring. All right. So enough with what you shouldn't do. Here's what you should do. Here's the the things we will go through in. And we'll go through them practically. I will do this with a partner and show you. But here's the things you ha we're going to go through. We're going to go through measure. We're going to go through understanding the guards that dictate measure. We're going to go through the attacks. Okay. If you have these down, then the rest of the techniques tend to fall into place on their own. So usually, what I, in my experience, what people lack is this part. They usually under, quickly come to terms with the, the, the techniques and find ways to do that, but they don't know how to put them into to a sparring context in a good way. So this is how to do that. So the first thing we have to realize is what measure are we going to start off in? We're going to start off in Zufechten. That's very clear in Meyer. He specifically states so several times. The fight starts off in Zufechten. He said, almost every technique starts like this. In Zufechten, you are standing in this and that guard. It says onset in the Foregang manual, but that is that is Zufechten he's referring to. So, and Zufechten is good because it's a well-defined distance. It is the distance where you have to take one full step in in order to, to attack, threat, properly threaten, do a threatening attack to your opponent. And likewise, I have to do the same to my opponent. <laughs> so, that keeps it as a distance. Now, what's important about this is that that is where the guards really shine. The guards are designed to keep your opponent in Zufechten. That is one of their properties. There are several more, and I'll go through those when we get into the proper sparring. But the guards in Meyer are very often kept where your, your hand is either kept straight up or straight down or very close to your body here. And the reason for this is, and the point is forward. The reason for this is you want to keep a threat, the point of the weapon, threatening your opponent, so that the moment he starts coming closer, you will attempt to stab him. At the same time, you're keeping your weapon arm as far away from your opponent as possible, uh, so that he cannot easily engage with your weapon arm. Because the moment he starts to engage with your weapon arm, it doesn't really work that well. He starts to exert control over it. And you have to deal with that instead of being able to attack him. This is also why you don't see this kind of guard in Meyer. There is a, perhaps an argument that you see a guard like this with a dagger out here in, in Fiore. Personally, I think that might be a misunderstanding because it's in the part where there is also, there's supposed to actually have a, a quarterstaff in this hand. And that would mean that he's basically keeping the hand back to because the quarterstaff is in front. So he's trying to keep the dagger offline so that the opponent cannot start interfering with the dagger. That's my personal interpretation of that. But never mind, this isn't about Fiore. Uh, so all this is to keep your opponent at, in measure, in in the measure of zu fechten. And this is, on a psychological level, you're actually providing your opponent with a way out. You're, you're presenting yourself in a guard that if he knows what he's doing, he will realize that, oh my god, if I, I cannot attack this person without seriously endangering my own life. So he has to make the choice. This is like saying, do you feel lucky? Well, do you punk? It's that you're, you're giving him the, the, you're describing the consequences as it is. You're saying, okay, you can attack me, but not without serious threat to your own life. Or as Mr. Miyagi says, you, why you learn karate, Daniel-san, in order not to fight, which is basic. So on a psychological level, you're, of giving your opponent an option out. So the rest of this I will describe mostly in the, the part where I have a partner, but for the attacks, you will see that the reason why the attacks look the way they do, they will start to become apparent when you realize that you're attacking from Zufechten. That is why Meyer's attacks are quite long and, and e extended and you don't see the short attacks to any degree. It's another reason, not only does it the, do powerful attacks penetrate Gambeson, but long attacks are required in order to get from Zufechten 
into where you're properly attacking your opponent. Now, this was video number one. Welcome back to video number two, where I will go through uh, some of this with a partner, and there will be a video number three where I go through the rest. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for watching, and bye-bye.